the cookie cutter. A simple tool used to mold treats into shapes, animals, people, and more. No one knows who invented the first one. But they became popular with the gingerbread man shape in the 16th century, with the first documented instance of figure-shaped gingerbread biscuits being served at the court of Queen Elizabeth I. However, they first gained widespread popularity in the 1800s, being made from tin. These became very popular in America. Over time, the materials and shapes would change, reflecting the world they were made in. But they remained a fixture in the American kitchen, with many collectors saying, you can trace the loves and attitudes of our country through the cookie cutter. In the heartland of America, in the city of Joplin, Missouri, sits the National Cookie Cutter Historical Museum. Located within the Joplin History and Mineral Museum, this unique Route 66 attraction tells the fascinating history of the often overlooked kitchen tool. The National Cookie Cutter Historical Museum was founded decades ago and was originally housed in Knightstown, Indiana. The museum was created through the efforts and contributions of members of the National Cookie Cutter Collectors Club, which has members across the United States. We sit down with Kay Johnson, who gave us the history of the museum and her involvement with the project. I uh, am the co-curator of the National Cookie Cutter Historical Museum. I've been uh, curator since 2009. Became a member of the National Cookie Cutter Collectors Club in 2005 or 6. I saw an article in the Joplin Globe newspaper giving pictures and an article on the opening of the National Cookie Cutter Historical Museum in Joplin. And so I thought, wow, you know, I'm retired now. That might be something I could be interested in. Soon, Kay realized she had found herself in the Cookie Cutter Collectors Club, an organization of cookie cutter lovers that dates back to the 1970s. And if you could talk about how the club was founded. Okay. In the mid-70s, um, a lady named Phyllis Weatherall sent a letter into a woman's magazine just saying, you know, I like cookie cutters. If anybody else is interested in cookie cutters, you know, uh, write me a letter. Uh, you know, we weren't into computers at that time or faxes, etc. So there were uh, four or five ladies who began corresponding and they soon had others and uh, in a couple of years they had a meeting just to get together, get acquainted and one of them would type a letter and then it would be sent round robin to all the rest. And then Phyllis Weatherall uh, said, you know what, if you'll just send your letter to me, I will uh, copy it, make a little newsletter. And so she had one for a while and then a few years later the club began the current newsletter. It's called Crumbs, very fittingly right. And then soon people would find, well, there's you know two or three other people in my area. You know, we could drive and get together for coffee or a sandwich. And from then came uh, several regional clubs, like we have the Gingerbergs in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Texas Blue Bonnets. We have Heart of America, which this little uh, lapel pin represents the heart in the middle of America. Can also be used to cut dough. So they're cookie cutter lapel pins. And that's composed of members in uh, well, Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa. We've had members from Illinois. Several regional clubs that get together once or twice a year. A meeting, usually a Friday night dinner, and then a Saturday program. Uh, usually people bring duplicate cutters they have to sell, and we call it a scramble. And just another way to get together and learn about cutters. And it's very easy to become familiar with people's family and where they live and uh, just another way to associate with people 
and it's seldom that a week goes by that I don't get a phone call or make a phone call to uh, one of those collectors. Some people specialize in collecting one type of uh, an image, like all they love all gingerbread cookie uh, shapes of cutters. Uh, some people don't like plastic cookie cutters and they want to go to the metals. We have some people who tend to collect only those handmade by tinsmiths. The tinsmiths, this case, and there's probably over 250 tinsmiths in the United States. This is how usually the tinsmiths make their cutter. It's put on a form, on a block of wood, and then they wrap their metal around it, and that's how the cookie cutter is formed. And then they put either a back on it, some have handles, some are just open, and some are made out of copper. We have one, I'm not sure if it's here. Whoop, we got a puppy. But the old spam cans, where you had that little twist around, there's a cutter that's made from that piece of metal around that can. About this time, you may be asking yourself, What's so special about cookie cutters? For Kay Johnson, a former teacher, it's all about the history. Cookie cutters are about much more than cookies, much more. You can follow the history and culture of our country, the pastimes of the citizens. The word historical in the title for the museum is there for a reason, because we are representing the history of cookie cutters. In the Revolutionary War days, it was uh, forbidden for tin to be made in the colonies. It had to be shipped in from England, so it was a pretty pricey uh, commodity. After the Revolutionary War, they were able to make their own tin. The oldest cutter that we have is actually this egg baking powder cutter given away as a premium from the Egg Baking Powder Company in the very early 1900s. The early cutters were, in America, were of what people were familiar with, their farm animals. They like to play cards for a pastime, so we get the into the heart, diamonds, etc., the card uh, suits. Uh, many, many sets of cutters are made with those shapes. Things they were familiar, familiar with, like this rabbit. Uh, this was from the Forme, I believe that was a shortening company. And this was uh, to promote the products. Many companies used their imprint on a cutter to advertise their products. Uh, so every time you used it, you saw their the name, you know, Bisquick or Sunmade Raisins or modern one would be the Pillsbury Doughboy. And then as technology changed, cookie cutters changed. And we went from the old yucky looking tin to aluminum. Oh, aluminum was such a, a treasure. One example of an aluminum cutter, of course, everyone uh, would remember the uh, colorful handles on the aluminum cutters in the 20s and 30s. And then later, we've got Betsy McCall. Uh, so we see another interest showing here. Uh, Betsy was uh, uh, a featured item in the McCall magazines for many years. There was always a page, Betsy McCall Paper Dolls. And here is a, a page where she is making her own image uh, into sugar cookies. I personally have this page framed in my kitchen <laughs> with the cutter by it. After the aluminum, the world went into plastic. Oh my goodness, we've got plastic and instead of just an outline cutter, they could have uh, impressions, lines inside the plastic that would impress the dough and therefore make uh, design lines to frost and ice and we now have 3D printed cutters that are made with the printer laying down fibers from an image that was that's being copied and so who knows what's next. <laughs> I wonder what's going to be the next move in the cutter business and of course now we've got Superman, we've got Batman, we've got Peanuts characters uh, uh, Hallmark, of course, followed uh, in the early 60s with the holidays and made, oh, they're still some of the most beautiful cutters. So it follows historically the culture and the interests of our country and uh, a neat way to learn. I'd like to mention the resource and research material we have. 
has been completely organized, printed by the collectors themselves. Hallmark never did a Hallmark cookie cutter book. We have a member who did, featured every cutter, information, images. She also did one on Wilton cookie cutters, but the Wilton Company didn't make that book. The Hallmark Company didn't make the book. And, and all the newsletters we've had, they've all been by volunteer work and knowledge. Uh, and I, I'm very proud of that because I don't know another group which can say that. The National Cookie Cutter Historical Museum features 12 cases of historic to modern day cutters featuring items collected from around the world. But how did this collection end up in Joplin? We talked with Brad Belk, Director Emeritus of the Joplin History and Mineral Museum, about the smaller museum and how the Cutter Collection came to be there. Uh, the museum uh, is one of the older museums in the state of Missouri. It uh, was uh, officially opened in March of 1931. And uh, the tribute was to, um, uh, to recognize this incredible mining history, this lead and zinc history that we have here. The plains of Kansas, the hills of Missouri, and the Oklahoma Dust Bowl make the Tri-State Mines. The Tri-State Mines are lead and zinc, 10% of the lead for America, and 38% of the zinc. They opened up a former concession stand that was idle at the time. They found a home and a niche, and they started telling the, the great history of the Tri-State Mining District. Most of our communities today would not be in existence without the lead and zinc mining. So it's a huge role of our economy and the businesses and the people and the schools and everything that's associated with that. Lead for pipes and bullets and gases, zinc for medicines and batteries and paint, thousands of tons of rock ore daily. It's a million dollar business, a million dollar business, million dollar, million dollar, million, 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 million. Eventually, uh, the Joplin Historical Society, another group of really ladies that weren't going to take no for an answer, um, and some gentlemen as well, but they saw the need and the passion to tell a, a larger scope of a story, more the history of Joplin. So we got this great mineral wing, so this is how we started with these lead and zinc, all right, and then let's tell more about the social history. So they came in 1976, added on a wing, and since then we've added on another wing, and so this is thing as, as most museums, if the, the resources are available, you continue to add on, and. Uh, and we've just continued to try to improve and make this better. It is a combination of museums. And then, you know, when we, we talk about this museum, there's Empire District Electric Company, that museum was in their corporate headquarters, so that was brought here. And the same thing with the, the, the cookie cutters, that was a museum that was in Knightstown that was brought here. Kay Starch, a cookie cutter collector, had a little shop in the living room of her home and she was selling some cutters and the idea with Cookie Cutter Club was, boy, it'd be nice to have them where, you know, they were accessible and, and safe, etc. Michael Bonney, who lived, he's a tinsmith, he lived in uh, Knightstown, Indiana, he's now in Florida, still working, uh, made Many cutters for Martha Stewart, very valuable, expensive cutters now. His working area was with a little shop. So he said, well, yeah, the club could put cutters there. He'd be fine with that. I cannot tell you how many years, just, just a very few years they were there. One of the collectors uh, stopped by. The shop was locked, electricity was off. And then when she did get access, it was just in a shambles. And it was like, uh-oh, we have a problem. <laughs> so the search search went out for a another museum where to put the cookie cutters uh, several mu museums were contacted asked some, many of them didn't have room uh, approximately 20 years ago we um, i got this call out of the out of the blue and there was a lady um, and she said that um, they had an operation they, she was part of this cookie cutter association that i was completely unfamiliar with and said that we were just calling uh, random museums to see if there was any interest or anything like that and I uh, spoke to my board of directors. I dug a little deeper into this and said, you know, well, um, this sounds kind of like fun, something interesting, not knowing really where this was leading. I flew to Indianapolis, and it's nearby um, Indianapolis, and um, drove there and met a fantastic group of primarily ladies. And we opened up the storefront where the, uh, the museum was. And they had uh, turned the lights out, and we had flashlights, and we were looking at the cases. and. I looked at the faces of the ladies and 
they really, really needed a home. And, and so, uh, so the whole situation was, as I went back to my board and I said, I think this is really something that makes, it, makes our stop a little bit more unique and it fulfills a, a need for these ladies who, uh, who are passionate. I mean, they're crazy uh, over, um, over cookie cutters. Uh, in six months or so, next thing we knew, the cases arrived and so did the ladies and the gentlemen. Two families of collectors in uh, Michigan took trucks and tarps and bungee cords and everything. Nobody could afford a, a moving company to do it. So these two fellows did that, put it on their truck, moved it to Joplin, unloaded it, put it all together. And they set up the first very few cases in the room. All parties were happy and excited with the, and, and pleased with our decision. And that started the story in Joplin. I personally love that it's in the middle of our country very accessible to so many people. Uh, I doubt many people from Joplin would <clears throat> end up in Washington, D.C. at a cookie cutter museum. You know, but they can come in and out of here at will. Being on Route 66, by the way, <laughs> easy, it's accessible. Not long ago, I had, I was, when I was here, there were, a lady came in, she's just gonna stay a minute, she said, I just wanna see the cookie cutters. She said, we're traveling U.S. 66, you know, Route 66. My name is Stacy Molinero. I've been here for uh, two and a half years. My title is Administrative Assistant. I think it brings a lot to the museum. We've had several people come that has seen it on like the Food Network channel. Uh, Pioneer Woman just did a uh, article in her uh, magazine. We've had some other articles and stuff done, but there's people that come from all over that have seen it or find out about it. Just since I've been here, we've had so many people come in. Uh, we feel that it's just a great selling point in the sense that it adds another fascinating aspect to stopping here, it makes this very unique. And um, so we're, uh, you know, when you talk about the, the, the different varieties of collections we have here, it really do uh, make us a distinctive stop. Since establishing itself in Joplin, the National Cookie Cutter Historical Museum's collections have continued to grow and grow. Over the years, the biggest hurdle the curators faced was keeping track of the massive collection. They have cataloged every single cookie cutter they have. That's talk about rolling up your sleeves and doing some some heavy duty lifting. Each cutter has an individual number and it is uh, adhered to each cutter. Hopefully where it's a little obscure where you don't just see it when you're looking at the cutter. So this is where the extra storage is. Okay, all of this are cutters up there that are inventory there. Okay, so all of them are labeled. Okay, these are from Mexico, Puerto Rico, Malaysia, Czech, Russia, uh, and then these are known companies. There we go. Okay, and these are these are tin smiths, and those are old metal cutters. If you're looking for somebody, then whatever his name is is going to be in here. They change every season. It's a bit difficult when you have a small staff to change out rooms all the time, but they always have something fresh and new and seasonal. Okay, these are all, okay. So see, when we take the Eastern Valentine's out, they'll go back in here. These are all Hallmark. Got three tubs of stamps and molds. So these would be like, be like this. And I don't think right now, I don't know as we have any of these out. And then down in this box is Wilton. Okay, we're here. These are our cookie club meeting books, like where they take pictures and stuff. In our storage facility and by appointment, we have probably six file drawers full of resource materials uh, that are available to people by appointment. And these are magazine articles. These are newspaper articles. And these are photos from the museum. So we just, Kay and I just the last two months have organized these drawers. Let's see if we can get one of these out. Okay, and these are also numbered. See, this is from Pittsburgh, this is Ohio, but there it's all over the United States. This is from 93. This is Ohio, I don't see a date. This is 86 there, 1986. All the cutters that we have here in the museum, with the exception of maybe 10 or so, have been donated. You know, what a legacy. 
send them to us or ask them if we will take them. And then we go through them, and if it's cutters that we don't have, then we will inc you know, introduce them into the inventory. Uh, many times uh, we'll hear from a family and they'll say, you know, my mother's passed away. I'd like for one of her cutters to be in the museum. We'll know where it is, you know, it won't get lost. We had, I think it was over a year ago now, uh, one lady, uh, I believe her daughter maybe donated her collection and that was 10,000 cutters. You know, that's, that's a way to remember people also. Uh, so a lot of it's very personally oriented. Every person involved in this project has a passion for not only preserving these artifacts, but also connecting visitors to something deeper. What I would hope with people when they stop here would be that they would um, A, enjoy themselves, and B, learn something insightful, something they didn't know, and connect to something. You know, the idea of collections is that it is collect. And we, we say, you know, when I talk to people and I say, do you collect anything? They say no. And then if you go in their house or something, they've just got collections, okay? And that's fine. They don't really see things as, you know, from my perspective as far as from a museum director's point of view. But everybody collects something in that respect. And so, but the key to museums is the relationship you have with um, the ar artifacts on display and how they're displayed. It, to me, it's... Um, it's an experience that you can't get anywhere else. And the artifacts that you have on display, and no matter where the museum is, are very unique. And they have a, a great story as well. So, you know, museums are, are put into place to enrich lives and to, to make things uh, uh, more understandable to some degree. So uh, the museum field is, is a, I think, obviously, a very, very important uh, part of our community. And the, uh, there are museums in little, little bitty towns and counties that um, are just postage stamps, but um, they are proud to tell their story, and we should be. You know, everybody's got a history, and every community's got a history, and so that's where the, the, the trains meet, uh, your connection and, and the connection of the community that you live in. When people visit the museum, I treasure listening to their comments of, oh, I remember grandma had some of those cutters, or my mom has some of those, or, or I remember making cookies with so-and-so, or maybe an aunt. Uh, and hopefully while they're here, they learn a little bit about the history of the cutters and see the, the older ones as well as the newer cutters. I do like to bake, and I do have a small collection of cookie cutters. Um, started when I was probably a teenager, uh, my mom always did the roll-out cookie cut cookies, and so that's just transferred on to my children and my grandchildren and trying to carry on the tradition, so, yeah. The, you know, the kitchen was a, was a major uh, point uh, where um, uh, people baked and, um, and, and children and, and grandmothers taught their daughters and daughters taught their, their children and that type of thing. This is a hand-me-down activity. Uh, this whole thing about, about cookie cutters and, and everybody can relate to it, but you know, we didn't, there wasn't just uh, rows of, uh, on, the, on the shelves of, of pre-made cookies manufactured. You know, the, the, the thought of love, you know, that this, this was made with love. Who doesn't remember if they had a grandmother or a mother who involved them in making cookies, who doesn't remember that those are things you don't forget, you know, in your lifetime. And you remember how it smells and, and working with the dough and, and the visiting that you did while you were, you know, making the mess. <laughs> Thank you for watching. We hope you've learned something new about cookie cutters and we hope you make plans to visit the National Cookie Cutter Historical Museum located in Joplin, Missouri. The museum is housed inside the Joplin History and Mineral Museum be sure to pick up a free complimentary cookie cutter when you visit. If you can decide which one. Yeah. Cool. That's why I said until you get into it, you don't realize how much there is to it. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you learn a lot more about just a plain old cookie cutter. <laughs>
Hey, I'm Kate Thomas, the director of this documentary. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, a lot of work went into this project and the other projects on this channel. Uh, check out the videos on here. It's There's a lot of other fascinating documentaries. There's a assortment of short films and comedic conversations, movie reviews, and more. Also consider supporting the channel at patreon.com slash Thomas. Link is in the description below. Special thanks to everyone who helped with this project. That includes my co-producer, Alex Clare, Krim Ruck. He did the cartoon and the music that you're listening to right now. But that cartoon in the beginning, ah, it was so amazing. And you should check out his YouTube channel, Krim Ruck Cartoons, also in the description. You should definitely check it out. He makes such great stuff. And then lastly, I have to call out Debbie Tucker, who hosted this program. She's so amazing, and I love working with Debbie. Be sure to uh, like, subscribe, and comment. Comment below something you learned about cookie cutters, because I certainly know I learned a lot during this process. So what was the fun little thing you learned here? Um, or any other knowledge that you know you'd like to share? Let's just have a cookie cutter conversation down below. Um, thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Bye. beautiful cat.